It's a pleasure for me to be here alongside my Universitas 21 colleagues, Professor Peter Matteson from the University of Edinburgh and Professor Tang En Chai from the National University of Singapore. Great to, to be talking with you. And I'm looking forward to a good panel discussion. I really am delighted to speak to all of you, our students, very definitely the leaders of tomorrow, about some of the most challenging issues facing the globe right now. And the question we were asked to address, how do you prepare yourself for leadership to take on those challenges? And it really does look to me like a great program, a program you're on to die for. And I hope that you're learning a lot, meeting great people, and having fun, and that you take away a lot from this, this week. In my remarks, I will focus on how universities, such as UNSW Sydney, where I'm the Vice Chancellor, define our role in solving the grand challenges of our time. And I, I hope you'll indulge me as I share some reflections from my own life as well to chronicle some of the milestones that have shaped my view of the world and inspired me to contribute wherever I've had the opportunity and to develop my ethos for leadership of generosity in par partnership. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with Adam Smith's theory of the wealth of nations. It's the idea that the invisible hand of market forces will guide people to act in their own interests and in turn the interests of nations and other people. Published over 200 years ago in 1776, it was very much a book of its time. In a more recent book, published just one year ago, called The New Wealth of Nations, Indian economist Surjit Bala put Smith's theory to the test. And he finds that in our world today, it's not economic capital that will determine the success of nations so much as it is human capital, education. He sees the proliferation of human capital through education as the most extraordinary leveller and force for equality the world has ever seen. And he points out that while the Industrial Revolution transformed lives primarily in the Western world, the Education Revolution has transformed lives all over the world. And he's right. We've seen nothing short of a revolution. In my lifetime alone, the literate population the literate proportion of the global population has increased from less than 40% to over 85%. And that's according to OECD and UNESCO data. And that trend is especially the case in the Asia Pacific. The OECD reports that in China, adult literacy has increased from only 64% in 1982 to almost 86% today. In India, literacy stands at 74%, increasing from just 12%, just 12% when India secured independence in 1947. As a doctor, a medical researcher, a development worker, an entrepreneur, and now a university leader, I've seen firsthand that education holds so many of the answers our world needs. In terms of research capacity, improving and saving lives through medical research and many other technological breakthroughs. In terms of education, building the world's human capital so that people are empowered to change the course of their lives and in turn to pass that privilege on to others through inspiring creativity and innovation and providing opportunity for those who start life disadvantaged. In a world where political interests are creating more walls and barriers than ever before, fear and anxiety are powerful and dangerous forces. 
But I believe, as, as I suspect, that everyone in this room does today, I believe in the collective power of universities to offset those forces. Former British Universities Minister David Willits has described universities as the equivalent, and I quote, of the giant California redwood trees in the natural world, deep-rooted, long-lived, and with the power to shape an entire ecosystem around them. In our growing climate of instability, we trust in traditional norms crumbling. Universities really can emerge as agencies for policy improvement and active pol positive change. A key driver of that is international education. No intention to offend Peter Matteson with this point, but Australia has just overtaken the UK as the world's second biggest destination for international students after the US. In Australia, international education is our third largest export, generating $32 billion per annum for our economy. It's important that our local students also travel abroad. The more students we have crossing paths with new people, the stronger our global civil society will be. That, of course, is one of the wonderful things about this, this meeting this week. And this matters because we need a strong civil society now more than ever. The problems the globe faces are of unparalleled urgency. Mass migration, climate change, food security, cyber security, and the higher education sector is uniquely equipped to tackle them. <coughs> At UNSW Sydney, we see ourselves as Australia's global university, and in that context, we run a Grand Challenges program which brings together world experts on climate change, refugees and migration, the pace of new technology, and the roots of inequality. We also run our Institute for Global Development, which exists against a backdrop of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We have hundreds of projects running in public health care, climate science, energy and water, sexual and reproductive health, maternal health, AIDS, HIV, defense, security and human rights. Our projects cross over 100 countries. But we also, importantly, run projects in Australia to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and to reach disadvantaged Australians. And we try to make our impact as tangible and transferable as is possible. For example, as Myanmar transitions from military rule to democracy, UNSW is working with local scholars on how constitutional law and reform can bring greater social and economic benefits. Another example is our partnership with Gulu University in post-conflict Uganda's north. And this has us collaborating on women's health, engineering, education, and post-conflict studies. We're working at Makerere University, where the Brian Holden Institute and our School of Optometry and Vision Sciences has established Uganda's first undergraduate program in optometry. And just like our work in Myanmar, our focus in Uganda is on building capacity, running programs for Gulu University academic staff, and facilitating visiting research fellowships in both directions. Our guiding philosophy in this sort of work is that collaboration is the key to success. Our educators and researchers in Australia have both a great deal of expertise to offer, but a great deal to learn. We try to live our mantra of generosity and partnership, which brings me back to where I started, why human capital is so powerful. By definition, Knowledge is transferable. And I really believe that the most valuable contribution we can make as leaders is by building the capacity of others, passing our knowledge on. And I'm proud of the fact that so many of our students at UNSW, like you, have that strong sense of responsibility 
to be a force for good in the world. One of my favorite stories from UNSW is of third year chemical engineering student, Budi Rana Singh, who decided to get six of his friends together to use their skills to solve some of the basic water and sanitation problems faced by rural farmers in his home country of Sri Lanka. After realizing that people were spending a large proportion of their income on buying water, the students built a water filtration facility so the village they were working in could become self-sufficient. That facility now delivers 10,000 litres of clean water per day to more than 600 families. It's created three jobs. But most importantly, all the profits are being reinvested in STEM, business and entrepreneurship education for the local people. That, for me, is the essence of great leadership. Putting your skills towards expanding the opportunities of others. It took me a bit longer than Buddy and his friends to realize that. At the end of my medical training, age 24, I traveled to Kenya to work on a research project. And that project took me out of the com outside the comfort of the southeast of England, where I'd spent most of my life in Cambridge and London, to right into the heart of the shanty towns of Nairobi in Kenya. That trip had a pivotal impact on how my life and career would unfold. For a start, I fell in love with Africa. And it inspired me to return when in my 40s, as a professor at University College London, I had the opportunity to establish and run the Uganda Women's Health Initiative. But more broadly, it helped me to gain perspective on the world and my place in it. It helped me to realize that I had opportunities that others could not have dreamt of just by virtue of where I was born. I'd never thought of myself as particularly privileged before that, but I was, and extraordinarily so. At each step of my career since, I've gravitated towards work that enables me to share the opportunity that privilege has given me. I found working as a doctor in a clinical setting extraordinarily rewarding. It's a massive privilege to help people at some of the most challenging times in their lives. But I also found it constraining, given the challenges out there in the world, only to be able to assist one person at a time. And I realized that I may be able to do more through research to stem the flow of disease on a larger scale. So I moved into medical research, looking into cancer screening processes, which had the potential to possibly save many thousands of lives and from there into higher education to provide opportunities for the next generation of students and researchers who may well eradicate cancer altogether and have an impact on countless major challenges. Now I realize that many of you will have come from challenging backgrounds and many of you will have had to go through difficult times to be here. But by virtue of being here at this event and by being at the universities where you are studying, you are all privileged. So if I could pass on just one piece of advice to you, it would be to figure out how you can share that privilege with others. Now that may sound trite and easy to say, but I believe that it is funda fundamentally important in leadership. And as much as I would like to take credit for this, it's not an original idea. Fortunately, many of the world's most effective leaders have said it before. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, when he said that real leaders recognize their role as servant. Bill Gates, when he remarked that as we look ahead into the 21st century, leaders will be those who empower others. Michelle Obama, when she said that when you walk through the doorway of opportunity, that's all of us. Don't slam it shut behind you. 
Instead, reach back and give others the same chances that helped you succeed. They all agree with me that true leadership is doing what you can to foster the potential of others and share the opportunities you've received. Realizing that is, I think, the key to a fulfilling life and career and to unlocking the true wealth of nations to transform humanity for the better. Thank you.